Um, but I would like to begin by recognizing the lands of the Pueblo people on which the sites of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum stand. We recognize and honor their elders past and present and celebrate the vitality of their people today and into future generations. I offer this, <clears throat> excuse me, I offer this with humility and gratitude and acknowledgement of the need to confront the ongoing injustices of settler colonialism. I would like to extend a thank you to our members and donors who are here today. Your support made this event possible. And if you're not a member yet and enjoy this program, please consider joining today. Visit gokm.org slash membership to learn more. Throughout this talk, please place your questions in the chat, which can be found at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your device. Um, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the conversation. Please note that following today's talk, a recording will be made available on the O'Keeffe Museum's website in about a week's time. Captions in, in both English and Spanish will be made available. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter this morning. It is Nicole Dial K. Just really quick, Nicole Dial K came to the Harwood Museum of Art in Taos, New Mexico in February 2020 with a passion for curating exhibitions that reflect the diversity and talents existing in Northern New Mexico. Nicole joined the Harwood Museum, the Harwood team with 15 years of museum programming experience. She held positions at Breckenridge Creative Arts in Breckenridge, Colorado, Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art in Boulder, Colorado, CU Art Museum, Boulder, Colorado, Pratt Museum, St. Louis Art Museum, among others. She received, she received an MA in Art History from University of Colorado Boulder, an MA in Museum Studies from University of Missouri, and a BA in Art History from, from Southern Illinois University. We are both fellow um, folks from the Midwest, from Illinois. Um, and in her free time, Nicole enjoys traveling the country in her 1978 Volkswagen bus alongside her husband and two dogs. Um, so happy to have you, Nicole. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you for that great introduction. Awesome. I'm going to step aside. You can take it away. Um, thanks again, Chikle, and thank you to the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum for this invitation to speak today. Just give me one sec to get my presentation up. <clears throat> um, so today I am going to discuss the utopianist counterculture dreams that shaped the experience of artists in New Mexico in the 1920s and 30s when Georgia O'Keeffe arrived looking specifically at the Mabel Dodge Lujan house in Taos, and then to how that idealist view of New Mexico conflicted with the realities of existence here uh, for the longstanding residents, especially those in Hispano and indigenous communities. Um, this lecture is not specifically about Georgia O'Keeffe, but more about the context within which she arrived. So when I speak about counterculture, I'm talking specifically about an oppositional stance taken by American reformers, radicals, writers, and artists who contested the mainstream development of American society and culture. Um, a lot of times in our history, that's included rebelling against rationalism, against intellectualism, against class, gender, and ethnic differentiations, um, against corporate, imperialist, capitalist ethos, um, and frequently in these movements, we see a combination of exploration of psychic change along with social change. In American history, we've really had three salient counterculture rebellions um, that we can identify, all prompted by some sort of global change or trauma. The first of those is transcendentalism, which was a philosophy from the early 19th century um, that included Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, was largely in New England um, and promoted intuitive spiritual thinking instead of scientific thinking. The next movement and the one that we are going to be discussing most today uh, took place 1900 to 1920 in the wake of the U.S. Ma maturing into a major capitalist industrialist empire. And this move really spurs the post-World War I expatriation to New Mexico by Anglo writers, artists, and reformers. 
Here in this image, we see the tea room in Greenwich Village, which really was um, sort of the heart and soul of this bohemian counterculture movement of the time. And then the last movement happened in the 1960s around the Vietnam War. Uh, and that movement really was a protest against racism and imperialism and exploitation and abuse of the environment. So I'm using three primary sources for the talk today. Um, the first is Mabel Dodge Lujan and Company, American Moderns and West, which was written by the great um, academics, Malin Wilson Powell and Lois Rudnick. Also this work by Lois Rudnick later in her career, which has um, a much less romantic look at this group of artists called Utopian Vistas. And then the last source um, that I wanna mention is art, tourism and race relations in Taos toward a sociology of the art colony by Sylvia Rodriguez. So in this uh, book by Lois Rednick, she says that many from the counterculture movement in the turn of the century and in the 60s chose to spend time in Northern New Mexico. And frequently these individuals came from very powerful centers on the East and West Coast. A lot of them were from the ruling class with really um, strong networks of families, of schools, of economic and political connections who were all in search for alternative communities and cultures. Uh, these creative in individuals really connected to the physical and cultural landscape of northern New Mexico. She also puts forth that there was a prevailing belief that the Southwest could encourage forms of holistic thinking that could inspire men and women to dream of refashioning the entire world anew, all here in the Southwest. Uh, she also says that within all of the countercultural movements that I mentioned, uh, we can trace out an indigenous American radicalism. Um, and within this, there's this utopian and spiritual cast of the ever dying out Native Americans who hold intrinsic knowledge from the earth. They hold uh, these, these mystic essentialist truths that have to be captured before they're gone. The West is this locus for prophetic pronouncements um, for experiments and in, in uh, what can happen around this this mystic um, this mystic truth that exists. Now, uh, Lois goes into the '60s and what happens, interestingly enough, at the Mabel Dodge Lujan House, we see two of the counterculture movements, the 1900s to 1920s, and then again the 1960s, both take root at the Mabel Dodge Lujan House. In the 60s, it's Dennis Hopper and the hippies. Um, that is outside of our scope of discussion today, but if you were interested, um, Lois's book does a great job of covering that. And here we see Dennis on top of uh, Mabel's house with the Taos Mountains behind him. So what was happening in the world that inspired this dramatic move to the Southwest? Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, America has really emerged as this leader in urban industrial empires of the world. There's intense waves of immigration happening. Um, they estimate something like 15 million immigrants in two decades came into America. Economic upheaval comes, class division comes, and all of a sudden we return to this question of what is America's national culture? Who are we? How do we define ourselves? Uh, skyscrapers are going up, cities are expanding, and at the same time in the war, technology and science is being used to create new terrible atrocities of war. So we start to link this idea of cities and technological innovation with innovation and war. A lot of people in uh, in these counterculture movements see this and say, we need to turn away from what's happening here. And we need to look at those cultures that have been ignored, that have been rejected. We have to disrupt this move towards intellectualism, towards rationalism, towards scientific thought. Uh, Alfred Stieglitz was the most important articulator of the counterculture vision uh, for this group of artists in New York. He remains a common denominator amongst many of the artists who come to visit Mabel Dodge Lujan in New Mexico. Huh. He is such an important leader that people rally around in part because he's engaging in really uh, 
influential patronage of European and avant-garde art at 291 is gallery. He's editing the journal camera work and his own impact on modern photography and the aesthetics of photography as an art form. So Stieglitz grows a cohort that share the belief that modern art can heal the psyche and the divisions within society itself. He also argues for a Native American culture that will establish its own viable traditions without imitating or emulating Europe. And he calls on, on American artists to really create their own authentic art out of a fully realized sense of place here in our country. So he never visits New Mexico. Um, he's a lot more bourgeois than some of the other people who end up here, but his impact, his call from New York City really has uh, incredible ripples through what happens over the next decades. There are three movements that um, I do want to bring up that heavily influence what happens next. Uh, the first being transcendental modernism, which is an aesthetic based on eclectic, an eclectic legacy of ideas um, linked in American intellectual life since the turn of the century and including theosophy, Eastern religious philosophy, 19th century transcendentalism, the progressive era, which is really sort of um, wrapping up about around this time, uh, or what we think of it, at least in, in how history is taught, uh, which includes a period of widespread social activism and political reform across the U.S. focused on defeating corruption, monopoly, waste, and efficiency. And then finally, the New Thought movement, which I think is maybe one of the most influential movements, uh, especially for Mabel Dodge Lujan. It's a U.S. spiritual movement around the accumulation of wisdom and philosophy from a variety of origins, such as ancient Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Chinese, Taoist, Vedic, Hindu, and Buddhist cultures. So artists are turning away from the urban centers, and we start seeing these art colonies pop up all over America um, in 1890 through 1910, especially. We see them in Provincetown, Old Lyme, Woodstock, Carmel, and of course uh, in Taos and in Santa Fe. Uh, artists and intellectuals were taking to the woods, to the dunes, to the deserts as a way of life, looking to forge those meaningful connections with nature, those meaningful communi communal existences. Uh, and they often set up galleries, studios, schools, arts and crafts workshops as a part of that. Uh, this really is a complete rejection of the urban landscape. They believe the urban landscape cannot provide what they need to make this social change at this point. The city is the home of the machine civilization, the symbol of power. So colonies in opposition are arts focused. They're looking to paint in nature. Um, Many of the artists who end up coming to New Mexico are involved in the arts colony circuit. Andrew Dosberg, who is later considered the leader of modern the modern art movement in New Mexico, spends time at Provincetown and at Woodstock. Mabel Dodge Lujan and uh, Marston Hartley were both at Provincetown also. And I should mention, um, while we're talking about Taos today, the arts colony in Santa Fe was uh, also quite influential, and it was established around um, Alice Corbin Henderson and Mary Austin. So why New Mexico? Uh, New Mexico has actually played a huge role in the development of American modernism. It's comparable in impact to that of Africa and Asian cultures and European modernism. And Many of these visionaries loved that connection. Um, in Mabel's book, Taos and its Artists from 1947, she actually posits that Taos might have come out of a small band of devotees who followed Lao Tzu westward out of China, imbued with the teaching of the Tao. This, this is not true. Um, but you can see that they really wanted to, to mystify and call upon that, that, uh, that connection. So American modernists, really desired to break down the essentialist truths as a means of opposing to Western society. They believe Western society has moved too far away from nature, too far away from the essential knowledges that exist there, and that has caused the political, social, and moral disorder that exists. And they say New Mexico's physical and cultural landscape serves this agenda. This is the road in 1911 from Santa Fe to Taos. You can see it was uh, quite an epic journey to get here. So it really was this, um, this difficult 
process and trip to come to this magical place. Um, around this time, we have a lot of tourism promotions that are coming out of the Fred Harvey Company. In these images that are being dispersed nationwide, you see these wide open, untouched, grand, beautiful landscapes just waiting for visitors to come and make their mark or gather inspiration from. Um, this particular adver advertisement is for the Indian Detours feature, which was one of the, the most popular. We also see uh, being promoted in this physical landscape, the idea that your body and your mind can benefit from a trip to the Southwest. Um, the climate was supposed to help, the arid climate was supposed to help with any sort of lung um, ailments you might have. The hot springs were said to cure all kinds of things, including rheumatism. This image is from Truth or Consequences, where they claim the most famous cure for rheumatism. Uh, of course, up here in Taos, we had O Caliente and another hot spring that was in Talpa. So on top of the physical landscape, the cultural landscape was just as, if not more, intriguing to these artists. Um, a lot of them really wanted art to be removed from this place of elite leisure activity and put back into daily life practice, into daily, um, into purposeful, purposeful use. So with the native communities that were here, primarily the Pueblo communities, um, they were enthralled by the idea that these individuals were living in a subsistence economy based on agriculture, pastoralism, and hunting. They're only taking from the land what they need to feed and clothe, and that arts are central to daily life, work, play, religion. Their art is created for both beauty and use. Um, and here's two gorgeous examples from the turn of the century from Acoma Pueblo. The Hispano community, have a slightly more complicated relationship with this group of individuals, but they still mythologize and are fascinated by parts of their culture. Uh, the reliance on land for traditional subsistence pastoralism, um, common land usage. Many of the members of the community would have shared tracts of land they would farm, um, and also devotional art practice. Uh, devotional art or santos is an art practice that's endemic to New Mexico and Southern Colorado. And it really grew out of this moment when many had been converted by uh, Catholic missionaries. The Catholic missionaries had left the area and there's this giant ecclesiastical void that's happening. Uh, so they start creating these saint images as a communication device between the earth and the heavens. So again, we see that purposefulness of the artwork. Um, these pieces are instruments within a network of uh, related activities like prayer, penance, pilgrimage, processions. Um, they are both art and purpose, both art and life. And these are two works from the Harwood collection. The left is Jose Rafael Aragon and the right is Pedro Fresquez. So of the individuals who see New Mexico as this great place where they can, they can find an answer to these questions, Mabel Dodge Lujan is perhaps the most influential person who locates New Mexico as her destiny. Mabel had spent a lot of her life searching for a home. She felt very orphaned in the 20th century. Um, and eventually she finds a home in Taos, which she calls a haven from the restless world. But prior to coming here, she had built a reputation as a cultural magnifier, as an ex expat in Florence, Italy from 1905 to 1912, and then in New York City and Greenwich Village from 1912 to 1917. And in both of those locations, she established herself um, with salons of creative thinkers, where they're really discussing a lot of the ideas that I've put forth already in this presentation. So Mabel comes to Taos in 1916. She builds a three-story, 22-room house uh, with five guest houses located on 12 acres contiguous to uh, Taos Pueblo land, so a huge compound, especially for Taos. She brings 
countless important artists to the Southwest in an attempt to make her home the center of a new world plan to regenerate Anglo civilization from urban industrialist bias, uh, to save them from their individualist and materialist credo. She believes this is part of her ushering in of a brave new world of social justice and aesthetic freedom. And to Mabel's credit, a big part of her platform was being supportive of the rights of women and minorities, uh, promoting that they deserve a fair share of the nation's wealth and recognition for their contributions to American civilization. Mabel marries Tony Lujan, Antonio Lujan, in 1923. He's from the Taos Pueblo. Mabel believes that she is going to serve as a bridge between cultures. Uh, she, many visitors who come actually grow to love Tony a lot and write about this, including Georgia O'Keeffe. Mabel really sets him up as this Native American seer and sage. She writes that Tony's organic indigenous conscious is going to combine with her cerebral modern conscious and allow her to articulate the wisdom of Pueblo culture in terms that would effectively convince any modern Anglo man and woman of its value. Tony is, is actually quite brilliant and um, works with some of the visitors, especially John Collier, who becomes the, the chief of the Department of Indian Affairs um, and really pushes forward some important indigenous rights acts over this time. So who came to visit Mabel in this new utopian Edenic village that she set up in Taos? First was Maurice Stern, uh, who she was married to at the time. Maurice had been on a global search for this Garden of Eden. He was looking for a place that was simple, where beauty existed as part of daily living, um, and he believes he finds it in Taos. He ends up leaving embarrassed when Mabel starts a relationship with Tony Lujan, but he writes to her in the beginning, dearest girl, do you want an object in life? Save the Indians, reveal it to their world. Andrew Dosberg comes in 1918, uh, as I mentioned before, father of modern art in New Mexico, very important. He was in the 1913 Armory show, certainly one of the most important up and coming artists at the time. And he writes, Taos has the quality of a place in which to find God. In Taos, one could create the condition which we must be to receive and give ourselves the power of the mystic. Marsden Hartley comes in 1918. He is a member of the Stieglitz Circle in New York also. Um, he almost immediately upon arriving here begins writing about the prophetic visions he's having about the quote, red man and the landscape as sources for renewal of Western civilization and for the creation of American art. Carl Jung comes in 1925. He says this trip is one of the most important trips uh, of his life, one of the most important experiences that shape his work. He comes up with and, and um, develops the idea of the primitive man here. It is not only primitive man whose psychology is archaic, it is the psychology also of modern civilized man. D.H. Lawrence is maybe the visitor that Mabel is most excited about. She believes that Lawrence is going to be the midwife to birth new world ideas for her. So she invites him to come see the dawn of the new world. Lawrence has already been on his own quest to find a home for Rana Nim, a community of like-minded men and women who would practice a simplified economy and live by the organic consciousness that he preached. Mabel thinks this is perfect. She's already found it. The Pueblo are living this. Um, so Lawrence comes. Lawrence and Mabel are both very strong-headed individuals and neither will back down around their ideas of utopia. Lawrence ultimately becomes very disillusioned with the place. Uh, and near the end, he writes a play called Altitude uh, that is completely centered around a group of Mabel and her guests trying to make breakfast without... Uh, the normally present Native American servants who are there and how no one can figure out how to do it. Um, my favorite part is Mary Austin, who tries to turn every domestic chore into an archetypal experience. So lighting the fire in the kitchen stove is making an homage to the God of fire. So Lawrence um, clearly has his mind made up about what's happened here in this community. 
His last quote on the place is, it's all rather like comic opera played with solemn intensity, all the wildness and wooliness and westernity and motor cars and art and sage and savage are so mixed up, so incongruous that it is a farce and everybody knows it. Willa Cather also came here looking for inspiration and writes Death Comes for the Archbishop. She says she's looking, um, she's on a quest for sense of place that provides visual or verbal equivalents for the integration of material and spiritual values. Paul Strand and uh, Rebecca Salisbury Strand, later Rebecca Salisbury James, both come um, in 1926. Paul says he's searching for a vision of landscape in which socioculture and aesthetic factors are organically related a community that reflects a total cohesive and shared life. Ansel Adams is also here. He says his goal as an artist is seeking spiritual resonance as moving and profound as great music. Georgia O'Keeffe comes in the summer of 1929, a visit that completely changes her life. In the winter of 28, Mabel Dodge was up in New York trying to convince Stieglitz to show the works of Dorothy Eugenie Brett, um, who was painting a lot of the indigenous ceremonies that were happening in New Mexico and Arizona at the time. And while there, she invites uh, Stieglitz and O'Keefe to come to Taos. And the timing is perfect. O'Keefe is experiencing this moment of restlessness, uh, this desire for new subject matter. And Mabel is presenting her this opportunity. So O'Keefe and Rebecca Salisbury Strand come and stay uh, in 1929 in, in uh, Dodge's pink house and works in the studio. And she responds immediately to the landscape. She believes that the bare essentials of the land call forth her deepest creative instincts. She writes of the semi-arid terrain, the clarity of light, the vast scale of the mountain, the mesa and the sky offering visions of enduring beauty. And ultimately, she comes to define the Southwest for the country more than any other artist. Themes of her art that are already present really find a home here. The idea that art is life regenerative. There's mysticism embedded in natural forms. This return to origins with flowers, fossilized shelves, pelvic bones, moon, moon imagery, this association with birth and rebirth um, are all so present here. It really, it really makes sense. It really resonates. She's very taking with Antonio Lujan. She befriends him over the summer while Mabel Dodge is in Buffalo undergoing a hysterectomy. Mabel suspects they may be having an affair during this time. Uh, but Georgia writes, he's one of the most remarkable people I've ever known. He's wonderful to me like a mountain is wonderful or the sky is wonderful, but such an uncanny sense of life and human ways. Such a child and such a man at the same time, a very grand sort of human being. Now, Mary Austin, uh, Willa Cather, and Georgia O'Keeffe all become very close with Tony Lujan. They all write about him in this very similar manner. He becomes part of the New Mexico landscape. Uh, all of them pay tribute to his masculinity. He embodies the spiritual force that they believe resides in the land. And they all ascribe attributes, these notions of Tony as a child man, um, which are embedded in primitivist stereotypes. George is not only excited by the land, but also this opportunity to follow Stieglitz's call to create a truly American art in this new place. And you can see her here in Red, White, Blue, Cow Skull from 1931, experimenting um, with that idea. Georgia stays in Taos for two summers. She creates 18 works, which Stieglitz shows in New York to great critical acclaim. Uh, the letters home from her first summer reveal this ecstatic nature of encounters with the land, her uh, self-discovery as a woman, renewal as an artist entwined with nature. Here in Lawrence Tree, there's this very unique perspective as we look at this work because George is laying down by the roots and it's meant to be viewed from the root system. This ethereal spiraling out of the tree that joins the cosmos above us um, but we remain firmly rooted in the ground, firmly rooted in nature, firmly rooted in those rationalist, essentialist truths that exist uh, in the earth. 
Georgia also created uh, this work, Black Cross, in 1929, and we see an enlarged cross superimposed on the sacred mountains of Taos, the Taos Mountains, and the Songa de Cristos. Um, there was some feedback that, oh, has Georgia gone religious, but she was very adamant that her fascination was in the domination of the Southwest landscape by Spanish Catholicism, um, and that was her interest in, in this imagery. So here we have Spanish Catholicism in the front, but in the back, as I mentioned, the mountains are sacred, are representative of the Taos Pueblo community. So the domination of Spanish Catholicism is almost contested and absorbed by this much more ancient and nature-based religion behind. So you see both cultural landscapes really represented here. There are so many other individuals that come during this time who deserve mention and who are speaking on similar themes of mysticism, on similar themes of finding ancient truths um, and using that for their purposes in their artwork that I'm, I'm just not mentioning because of time. Um, but I do briefly want to point out Aldous Huxley, Agnes Pelton, Katie Wells, Frank Waters, Dorothy Eugenie Brett, so many dancers, choreographers, authors, um, psychoanalysis, psychologists that are all coming here around these ideas, around this utopian um, ideal that they want, they want to experience and using that in their artwork. So now that we've sort of laid out this, um, this bohemian dream world that's been created in the artwork that's coming out of it, I wanna talk a little bit about what was happening in New Mexico at the time outside of this contained world. And in order to do that, we really have to step all the way back to the compromise of 1850. Uh, New Mexico faced huge hurdles to become a state. When the Treaty of Guadalupe was signed in 1850, many thought that would be the jumping off point to be a state, but instead we spent decades and decades, 60 years in fact, uh, fighting to become a state. And in correspondence, correspondences with the government, it's pretty obvious that there are a lot of biases that are part of this decision. Um, it's stated at one point that New Mexico was viewed as full of empty wastes and dark-skinned ethics. You can see at this time, New Mexico and Arizona are considered part of one territory. Um, and the U.S. had never acquired a territory this large with so many individuals that felt foreign that were from other places that spoke other languages, and they didn't really know what to do. Um, in fact, General William T. Sherman was quoted as stating, the United States ought to declare war on Mexico and make it take back New Mexico. Uh, we were primarily Catholic spoke Spanish, were viewed as poor, lawless, full of outsiders. Um, so this kicks off the territorial period, which really was from 1846 to 1912, the time that New Mexico was a territory. And during this time, Taos and the region underwent enormous political and economic changes with social repercussions that were felt gradually. Um, and I, I just as a side note, I am not going to talk about the Civil War and slavery and the role that that had in New Mexico, but I would strongly recommend anyone interested in that um, to follow Nikesha Breeze, an artist coming out of Taos who's doing really fascinating and necessary work around those histories, um, but not today. So during this territorial period, uh, land speculation by Anglo capitalists was rampant. American conquest and incorporation eventually dispossessed Hispano families of roughly 80% of their lands. And those real estate moves have led to the continued control of the best lands in New Mexico by Anglo capitalists today. Um, a lot of those lands continued to stay in the hands of the wealthy and powerful. So many of these Hispano families are reduced to migrant workers with ties to small, marginal, village-based farms or ranchitos. Uh, Native Americans were confined to reservations and made wards of the state with special administrative or legal status. Um, again, a very complicated history. Uh, boarding schools were put into place. There was a lot of... Um, legal attacks on the rights of different indigenous tribes to practice 
ancient ceremonies um, to teach their kids different puberty rituals that um, were all happening during this time period um, and caused traumas that have lasted for generations. There was also a lot happening around natural resources, regional mining, timber, um, lumber industry, cattle, and agricultural booms destroyed natural resources. Those scars are still present on our mountains, um, in our rivers, uh, in, our, in our air. But all of these things are certainly visible as the landscape, even though they were not represented in many of the, the artworks that we've looked at. In 1906, the public domain in Taos County, which is more than half of its land mass, including the mountain wilderness, was declared a national forest and the property of the federal government. A lot of this land was used by the Pueblo for sacred rituals um, that had been happening long before Anglo settlers were here. This uh, reallocation of land curtailed Pueblo use, um, curtailed Hispano traditional uses of the era, and actually inaugurated um, one of the most famous legal battles of New Mexico, which was between the Pueblo and the U.S. government in an attempt to get their land back from the national forest allocation around the Taos watershed and the Blue Lake, which is uh, where they locate the, their uh, origin story. And eventually that was settled in 1970 by Richard Nixon, finally. So this first decade of the century, um, looking at these things we've discussed, land allocation, natural resource abuse, um, the federal government sort of taking and giving land as they see fit without uh, maybe necessarily considering the needs of people in the state, slip the upper Rio Grande Valley into a condition of economic stagnation that it is never fully recovered from. <clears throat> so finally, after 62 years of fighting racial prejudice to become a state, around 1910, it looks like we're going to make it. Um, and this is really prompted by a couple of things. One, the Rough Riders, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, US Voluntary Cavalry pulled heavily from New Mexico. They believed the dry or the they believed that the the hot desert climate would be similar enough um, that it would help them fight in Cuba. Uh, and they, the country seems to say, okay, you are showing your bravery, you're showing your loyalty, you're showing that you're willing to fight for the U.S. Now, now you can be called um, a legitimate state. We also have several railroads that are in operation. Our population is now over 325,000 people. Um, so President Taft comes to New Mexico, is finally convinced goes back to Congress, spends several more months negotiating with Congress, and then in 1912, 62 years later, we are given our statehood. Um, and this is a cartoon from the Wall Street Journal around that time. So this, we're talking 1912. Um, this is very close. Mabel Dodge arrives in 1916. The Tau Society of Art is already here by then. Um, these are not two separate time periods. This culture, this climate, um, the biases and prejudice that we're talking about are certainly here when this group of artists come and definitely the marks upon the land um, and the economics of the state. So the first painters to reside in Taos permanently were Bert Phillips and Ernest Blumenschein who arrived in 1898 on the recommendation of Joseph Sharp uh, who was another painter who only summered there until 1912 and then comes. Uh, the breakdown of Blumenschein and Phillips' wagon wheel north of Taos inspired the town's touristic origin myth. It's one we love to tell. Over the next three decades, W. Herbert Dutton, Oscar Burninghouse, E. Irving Kaus, Walter Ufer, Victor Higgins, and then E. Martin Hennings and Kenneth Adams make up the membership of the Tau Society of Artists. Uh, this was a landscape school. This was a portraitist group, largely of Native American um, individuals. It was also a social group and a very powerful business association. Their ability to self-promote and advertise um, is a huge part of the story of the Tau Society of Artists and the success they gained. They're active from 1912 to 1927 and then continue painting here for decades. So, um, some, a lot of times there's this, there's this separation between what happens with 
Mabel's group and what happens with the Tao Society of Artists, but the timeline is actually quite intertwined. And Malin Wilson Powell, the scholar who did the Mabel Dodge book, also recently curated a show and did a book called New Beginnings that places these two groups together and shows all of the influence back and forth um, in social circles and artistic influence. Um, so we can't really separate these two groups, even though I think there's this desire to do romantics and moderns. Um, but it's just, there was, there was much more um, commingling that was happening. For the Tao Society of Artists, there's certainly a similar appeal of the land, light, and cultures. Um, they were very, very fascinated with the indigenous cultures here. Um, in fact, I just came across a Taos Valley news article from 1917 reporting on an event at Blumenshine's house that says, Mr. E.L. Blumenshine was host to the Tao Society of Artists Thursday evening. The members came in various Indian costume, were seated about on the floor in true Indian fashion, and dined in the same posture. We wonder if they had knives and forks, or did they resort to fingers, Indian style also. They're not alone in this um, behavior that anthropologists sometimes call Indianism, of dressing up and acting as what Anglo individuals believe indigenous cultures look like, um, but it is a practice that they were participating in. So the art colony is really growing now from uh, this earliest phase of romanticist portraiture um, and landscape work in the 1900s, or in, in 1900, flowering into modern depictions on the same themes into the 20s and 30s. And at the same time that this is happening, Tao sees the golden age of the art colony represent the first phases of tourism and development in this area. The relationships between uh, the artists and the indigenous community are certainly worth looking at. Um, a lot of times, especially with the Tao Society of Artists, they were hiring them to sit as models and to perform domestic labor, two jobs that became intermingled. A lot of times men who worked for Cows and Burning House in particular uh, would do modeling in the morning, yard work in the afternoon, their wives would cook and clean and then do modeling. And sometimes these arrangements grew into lifelong relationships. Some models became so closely associated with particular artists that they colloquially took on their patron's surname. So Ben Lujan, who is seen here working with Kaus, became known as Ben Kaus in town. Jim Mirabal became known as Ufer's Jim from working with uh, Walter Ufer. Uh, this patron-client, master-servant, artist-model relationship have largely been perceived as mutually beneficial and described as much, but there's certainly a limit to what we can document about how the Taos Pueblo individuals actually saw this. Um, as I mentioned before, the Tao Society of Artists and Mabel's group were incredible self-promoters. They certainly pushed that dominant story. They pushed the narrative that's been told over and over again, and it's the story that we that we still know. So that is, that is really the documentation we have. Um, I did find an interview in Taos News in 1970 with Joseph Sandoval, uh, who was a model who set for artists over the course of his long life, beginning at age six, um, both TSA artists and the more modern artists. Uh, he recounts a memory, quote, when sitting as a young child for Kaus, Joe remembers that he became frightened at the idea of the artist catching his image in paint and ran out of the studio down the street. However, he was soon overtaken by Mrs. Kaus, who brought him back, chained him around the waist to a chair, within easy reach of a great bowl of luscious fruit and a tempting mound of cookies. A blanket was draped over the chain, says Joe, and Kaus, without further complications, completed the painting. These relationships were established um, on existing systems of power. Uh, American indigenous radicalism could not exist without those systems of power, the ability for one community to sort of pull from another. I'm gonna use the definition that comes out of the center for law and policy for systems of power that I think will give us um, a better understanding of those working relationships. Quote, the beliefs, practices, and cultural norms on which individual lives and institutions are built are rooted in social constructions of race and gender and embedded in history colonization, slavery, migration, immigration, genocide. 
as well as present day policies and practice. These systems of power reinforce white supremacy, patriarchy, and heteronormativity as defining power structures in the United States. Systems of power are oppressive and define relationships between marginalized communities and the dominant culture. They also shape social norms and experiences within marginalized communities. Systems of power feed the structural barriers that are at the root causes of inequity experienced by persons of color. These artists are operating within existing systems of power. We have an Anglo man depicting an indigenous person through their eyes, profiting off of a romanticized narrative of the community written by an Anglo creative, and then distributing this idea, this work, within the established systems of an Anglo art community. They're operating within and reinforcing problematic systems of power here. The paintings of Pueblo individuals were not realistic portraits of individuals as they appeared in everyday life. Uh, they're romantic compositions for which subjects are dressed in prototypical costumes. Um, they always are in this harmony with nature, caught at some pristine, eternal moment, uh, communing with the, the mysticism of nature. Oftentimes what they're wearing is ethnographically bizarre a lot of times. Um, their clothing came from Plains, uh, Plains tribal nations put on Pueblo men just for picturesque effect. Um, and they're always an image of the past. So we're not really seeing what's actually happening here in Taos in these images. Hispano individuals are depicted quite differently and they're never as popular of a subject, though there's plenty of work coming out of those, um, those communities in this time period. Um, it doesn't seem like modeling became a significant source of income for many Espano models. They're depicted quite differently. They're cast as distinct individuals in traditional workaday world, usually at a moment of labor, ceremony, or leisure. So these two works by Bert Phillips here um, are painted almost at the same time, and they appear to be from two different uh, points in history, two different places, two completely different communities, even though they are actually same time, same place. Um, so you can really see how that narrative is getting spun. Even the later painters uh, who came from these liberal political sentiments, who had professional training that might have pushed them towards social realism or who had actually shown that they were interested in social realism prior to coming to New Mexico, seem to assiduously avoid that direction once they arrive here. Um, and I would include in that Emil Bistrom here with this magnificent work of the storm over, over the mountains in Taos, Kenneth Adams, Louis Reebok later, um, Robert Henri, John Sloan. Um, and Robert Henri actually says that he turns away from realism to capture whatever of the great spirit there is in the Southwest. The relationship between the anthropologists that were coming to see Mabel Dodge Lujan is another um, area, certainly for research. We know that a lot of these individuals were really pushing Pueblo individuals for information around secret knowledges. Um, the Pueblo is really known for its ability to keep its knowledges within the tribe, any um, sacred ceremony um, or, or histories are often very protected for good reason, given what they've been through in our history of colonization in America. Um, but some of these anthropologists, including Elsie Clues Parson, most famously, really pushed people to get information out from the Pueblo. And what would happen is that those individuals suspected of leaking would then be, um, would face retribution from the tribe. So there were consequences to these behaviors. Um, besides Elsie, Tony Lujan also reported feeling very uncomfortable with pressure from Jaime de Angelo and uh, Carl Jung, who are both here. So many of these individuals get very involved in local community and civic affairs. Mabel Dodge Lujan creates a hospital. Lucy Harwood creates a library. Um, artists and literati in Taos and Santa Fe become ardent and effective proponents of native cultural, religious, and land rights claims. They lobby against the awful Bursum bill. Um, they support Taos Pueblo in their long 
legal battle for the blue, blue Lake, return of Blue Lake. Um, they also promote the revival of Native arts and crafts um, nationwide in different um, art markets, although there's a very um, strict idea of what Native art should look like. Um, they really wanted to reflect this primitivist idea of Native output. Um, but they're also very involved in this promotion of underdevelopment. Uh, they step up to protest any visible manifestations of modernization and assimilation in Taos. So they don't want running water, electricity in the Pueblo, uh, no non-adobe construction, no street paving. They want it to be quaint, rustic, scenic, and foreign from the rest of the country. Um, they really want to keep this idealized uh, goal that exists in their head. However, many of these individuals were independently wealthy. Many of them were getting their sources of income from outside of Taos, outside of Northern New Mexico. So they really weren't arguing for the economic feasibility of the area that many of the people who are in poverty here needed for the state to move forward. Um, and you know, funnily enough, despite all these arguments, these art movements are drawing tourism to this place more than anything. So they're actually part of this change and this evolution, despite their attempts. Um, and I include this great image by Andrew Dosberg of the original Harwood House with its old bell tower and uh, these beautiful historic adobe buildings and then one electric pole. Um, so the town incorporates in 1934, partly to promote itself as a tourist attraction. We continue to push for tourism. Um, I read a newspaper article from the early 30s saying that Taos was the best promoted city in the country at this point. Um, and that bringing in of people really sets off uh, a tradition that still exists today. We, we rely heavily on those individuals that come for tourism. Artists actively take a role in this advertising, apart from working for the Fred Harvey Company to create images for the railways and the advertisements. Um, they also participate in these annual summer fiestas where we really cement the story that is now told over and over, or still told over and over again. Uh, the parades would include Pueblo in front, then the Spanish conquistadors, then mountain men, American cavalry, and finally the artists with their broken wagon wheel reciting the story, this evolution, um, this march towards hierarchy that we've told uh, so many times. Um, in the 1930s, which is really the end of this time period, we'll consider the Taos population grows by 28%. Some of them are newcomers from this promotion. A lot of them are uh, individuals who had left New Mexico in search of work, had lost employment during the depression and came back to try to get by in farming and welfare. 60 to 70% of New Mexicans were on relief at this point. Rates of poverty and alcoholism were at record level. Um, and this is when all of these artists are here. This is when all of those images were coming out with these beautiful stories um, and these beautiful utopian images of this place. So there's a huge disparity between the outward messaging and the reality um, as we end this look at this time period. So in this lecture, I have emphasized the social inequality and harsh material conditions just to underscore the remarkable transformation of these liabilities um, and their, how they were treated to the popular Euro-American imagination via the art colony. I think Anglo expatriates were so hungry for a spiritual and psychic realities that often blinded them to the more unpleasant social, political, and economic realities that surrounded them. Mabel Dodge creates this image of Taos as a multicultural Eden, and that image existed right alongside a much less recognized economic reality of Northern New Mexico as a place where the majority of people lived in poverty. It ignored social realities of Taos as a community historied with intercultural prejudice and conflict stemming from Spanish American colonizing acts. Um, I'm gonna go back to Sylvia Rodriguez's um, article, Art, Colony and Race, where she says that she does not believe this distortion of reality was necessarily intentional. 
quote, the art colony converted in inequality and backwardness into marketable assets and promoted the perpetuation of those conditions by which these assets were sustained. This is not to say that the artist performed the task of mystification consciously or with cynical intent. On the contrary, they mostly believed their own fiction. Thus, while their paintings and writings certainly do not represent the situation as it actually existed in Taos, they do express what the artists saw or what they wanted and needed to see. There are vastly unequal volumes of generally available material expressing different ethnic viewpoints um, on this time period. Uh, Rodriguez says the indigenous person appears everywhere in Taos art as a mystified ideal, yet nowhere in dominant discourse do natives speak with their own unmediated voices. Hispanos are less sublime, yet nearly as mute. And this is exactly why it's so important that we discuss the nuances of this history. Um, and I'll end on this image. Uh, this is Ernest Blumenshine's Ourselves and Our Neighbors. Uh, and in this work, you see all the principles of the art community. Mabel Dodge Lujan is here. Tony Lujan is here. D.H. Lawrence is here. Members of the Tau Society of Artists are here. Um, Lucy Harwood is on the edge. And they're all looking face forward, individuated. The notes accompanying give us names of all of these individuals, except on the lower right corner where there are three faceless native individuals placed to the side with no identification. Um, and I think this is a great representation of who is missing? What are those breadcrumbs we can follow? What may not be as it appears in the dominant discourse and the dominant narrative that's been put out to the world? Um, thank you all for listening to me. I appreciate it. And I'm here for any questions you might have. Nicole, that was, that was amazing. Um, it's, it feels like, um, it feels like a huge, um, really savory meal where it's just like, there's, <laughs> there's so much going on and it feels like, um, it's something that, um, I need to come back to personally. Like, I can't wait for the recording of this, which by the way, for everyone there, this has been recorded. It will be available to you um, via our website. If you registered for this, we did have a mix up with our register button. So sorry if you got your link late. Um, we'll try to get that fixed for next time. Um, but if you registered for this, I'm also going to be sending out a link to everybody um, where you'll be able to access a recording of this. Um, I know that I'm going to come back and like rewatch because there is so much going on. Um, that I want to that I want to revisit um, really quick. Um, we're coming up on time, so I'm going to try to get a couple of these questions in that are just kind of housekeeping. Um, I think you just said the book again, um, but the name of the book by Sylvia Rodriguez that you were talking about. So the work by Sylvia Rodriguez is actually from a journal of anthropology. Um, I she's one of my favorite scholars to come out of the southwest and it's called art tourism and race relations in taos toward a sociology of the art colony and it was in the journal of anthropological research in the spring of 1989. awesome i'm going everything, to everything sylvia's written is incredible she's done a lot of works on um the different celebrations in new mexico and how they sort of perpetuate these stories or um you know, continue these dominant narratives over and over again. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, folks, I know that we do have some more questions, but we are coming up on time. I'm going to, in, in my email to you with the link, um, I'll try to include as many references as I can. I know that some folks are asking for um, any other sort of like books and materials that you referenced, um, which selfishly me too, I would also love to get some of those references. Um, somebody also asked about the woman that was painting indigenous ceremonies in the late 20s before Georgia went west that you mentioned. Maybe I can just get that from you later. I can include that. Um, that Dorothy Eugenie Brett, who was the only um, person who actually committed to Ronanim, D.H. Lawrence's utopian community. Fascinating character. I love her and her work is really beautiful. Awesome. And um, yeah, we are sitting at 10 a.m. I really do not want to take up 
more folks times. Thank you all so much for joining us, Nicole. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, like I said, I will try to include as many of these things as I can in the email. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and we will see you next month in the new year. Um, so happy new year, because we will not be seeing each other until then. Um, if you get a chance to go up to visit the hardwood, please do and say hello to, to Nicole. Um, um, would you like me to flip through the image credits also, just so that's on the video? Yeah, sure. All right, folks, thank you so much. Um, I will start closing this out in the next minute or so. All right, I think that's it. Thank you, folks. Have a great Bye. day.